Would you want that on your wrist or your hand or your collarbone or your head or your neck? I don't think so. There are some parts of the internet where people are saying that a flick cut or a flesh, not the same thing, can't cut effectively. Is that wrong? Is that right? Let's test it out. Hi folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladys Joy. Now, before we go into this, just I'm going to dismiss the flesh, okay? There's been a misunderstanding. Some people think the flesh is a certain type of cut. It is not a flesh is a certain type of uh, fencing footwork used in modern Olympic style fencing in order to gain right of way usually, uh, but fundamentally to do a large explosive step. It's nothing really to do with how you move the sword. You can do a flesh with a great big sword movement, or you can do a flesh with a little flick cut. Obviously in modern Olympic fencing, you're just making contact, you're not cutting. And that's actually the important point here. So the question is, can a flick cut cut through a target? Obviously this comes down to various things to do with um, the type of sword being used, the, uh, the lightness and speed that you can move it at, the edge geometry, the sharpness, and your edge alignment and various things like this. But the basic question here, here is, does a flick cut do much to a target. So we're going to test that out with some different swords. So clearly some swords can cut more easily than others and this is to do with their particular design characteristics. I've picked four swords here which I think should be applicable to this test. So they're not, uh, they're fairly good cutters, they're not the most powerful choppy swords, but for this particular type of flick cut they should be relatively applicable. So we've got one of the Royal Armourer's windless um, arming swords, the Type 14 arming sword uh, from the, about the year 1300. This has actually been sharpened up for me by Emberleaf Workshops. I'll put a link to them below. I've been working with them on sharpening swords, more about that in the future. And then there are three swords from LK Chen. There's the Persian Shamshir, there's the uh, rapier, the sort of military rapier, quite a broad rapier, and we'll talk more about that uh, in the future. And there's the Munich Town Guard Sword as well. Now, one of the really important things to state here is that there's a misconception about a flick cut uh, based on the fact that if we look at modern Olympic fencing, for example, the flick cut, as we find in Sabre, for example, is often given and stopped on the target because, of course, in modern fencing you're using, or indeed in HEMA, you're using a blunt sword and you're hitting something like a fencing mask or a person's jacket. So clearly you're not penetrating the target. That means that you're hitting like with a stick um, and when you hit the object you're stopping on it. Now clearly if you're stopping on the target you're not going to cut through it because you're stopping on it. We only have to very slightly modify this so that it goes through the thing we're aiming to go through. For example, someone's wrist or, or someone's neck. So you aim slightly to the other side of what you're intending to cut through, okay? The other important thing to state as well is that clearly a cut which moves in a large circle is gonna have more power. You are gonna remove bigger things. You're gonna cut through bigger mats, bigger tatami mats, bigger targets, heavier targets, penetrate more layers of clothing, this kind of thing, with a bigger cut. But of course, the price of doing a bigger cut is it takes more time, it traverses more distance, it's easier for the opponent to see and anticipate and defend against. And because it takes longer to get to the target, it's less likely to actually land on the target because the opponent will either move away or parry. So um, these very quick cuts are very, very useful. They might not be the most powerful cuts, 100% and I'm not arguing that they are, but they are nevertheless able to do things. So let's, well, or are they? Let's see what they do. We're going to start off with water bottle and then we're going to move to wood. I don't have any tatami mats uh, at all uh, here at the moment. They're quite difficult to get hold of in the UK. Maybe in the future we'll do te testing on meat and tatami mats as well with some different weapons. But at the moment I've got a relatively easy target, which is a water bottle, and then a relatively hard target, which is actually wood. And wood is much harder to cut through than a tatami mat, so I'll cover both ends of the spectrum. Okay, so just to demonstrate to start off with, I'm just going to do a simple full arm movement or elbow movement cut to just demonstrate it's easy to go through a target with a sword. I'm going to start off with the Munich Town Guard Rapier because it's sort of in the middle of the swords that I've got available to me here now. And then we're going to start looking at the flick cuts. Just a nice, simple, not particularly fast, not particularly hard, full arm movement cut through the water bottle. Easy, any of you can do that if you've got a sharp sword and a water bottle. So now what I'm going to attempt to do is with a minimum retraction of the sword, so I'm going to start with this extended, with a minimum retraction 
and a lunge step, try and do a cut into the water bottle, see what happens. Uh, it's a Coke Diet Coke bottle, in case you're interested. Um, so with a minimum retraction of the point, that is keeping the weapon in front of me, not with a big arm movement. No big problem, pretty damn easy. And hopefully you see there that I only move slightly off the target and with a fairly small rotation. Now I'm gonna do an even more exaggerated, more like the sort of cut that we see in modern Olympic sabre fencing. Uh, but I'm gonna, instead of stop on the target, I'm gonna aim slightly through it. So once again, I'm trying to do this with as little uh, sideways motion as possible, but with a lot of forwards motion. No problem, okay? Uh, cuts right through the water bottle, both sides. Not the cleanest cut but not the worst either. So now I'm going to try it with a completely different type of sword, the Persian Shamshir from LK Chen. This is a highly curved blade, a uh, very different type of balance. It's much more, um, although it's a very light sword, the point of balance is much further from the hand and obviously it's a very curved blade, which changes how I interact with the target. Just for historical accuracy, I want to mention that these types of swords are usually given with drawing cuts that draw across and through the target. They're not normally given with a flick cut like this. But they may have been sometimes. Um, we don't have a lot of treatises from this part of the world. We've got some, but not a huge amount. But anyway, let's see what happens on the target. Easy. <laughs> if anything, I would say it's even easier with a curved blade because the point of contact is oblique to the target. So although you've got slightly shorter reach because the blade's essentially curving away from the thing you're hitting, but when it hits, it hits at, a four, at least a 45 degree angle here and the rest of the blade drags through. That's what these are designed to do and they're really freaking awesome at it. So here we've got yet another type of one-handed sword. This is a Type 14 modelled exactly on an example which I took all the measurements from in the Royal Armouries. This is the Royal Armouries windlass line. This one, however, is super sharp, been sharpened up by Emberleaf Workshops, link below, and it's scary sharp. This is a heavier sword. The balance is quite far from the hand. This traditionally would have been used usually with a shield or a buckler, um, and it's all uh, from horseback. Um, and this is a big, beefy, heavier arming sword, so I can't flick it at the same speed. That's important because I can't accelerate the blade in as small a distance as I can do with those quicker, more responsive blades. So let's see what happens. So here we go. I'm trying to do this with minimal lateral movement, but I do still nevertheless have to aim through the target. I don't stop on the target, but that goes for cutting with anything. <laughs> doesn't matter if you're trying to cut a carrot with a kitchen knife, it's true. Uh, so it's true here as well. That was, I'll be honest, that was a little bit harder because the, you've got more weight in the blade. So you've got to yoink it back and move it forwards with a little bit more energy. But conversely, because there is more weight in the blade, that assists with the cut. So this is just a water bottle. I'll just grab that. Uh, pretty clean cut, actually. Uh, the, that jagged is actually just the label. If I peel, peel that back, you can see it's a pretty clean line. Um, so although it's just a water bottle, what's interesting is I could feel that this hit with more authority, but less speed. Now, funnily enough, for cutting water bottles, they're a very particular type of target. Obviously, hard on the outside, nothing on the inside. But that outside plastic is actually harder than something like a tatami mat. So it's not an inconsiderable target, and it's still a measure of something. It's still a useful test, and it's free. Um, and 
what I could feel with that target was that it actually went through the hard material more easily, but more slowly. <laughs> now, water bottles are actually easier to cut with a faster moving lighter blade. So if you want an optimal sword for cutting water bottles, get the lightest, quickest, sharpest blade you can. That blade won't necessarily be very good against very thick tatami mats or wood or, you know, dense targets, but be very good against um, water bottles. So for this sword, it was harder, but nevertheless still did the job. I think with fairly minimal sideways movement, essentially just pulling it up a bit and forcing it through the target. And in fact, just because that was quite different to the others, I'm going to do another bottle just to see if I can get any more feedback from this sword. And I should also mention, all of these bottles are going to fall off this post because it's rotted over winter and split, and it's very, very precarious. So, do you know what? I've got to, I've got to fess up there. Um, that was a beautiful cut, but I realised that I moved it further from the uh, forwards line, from, further from the horizontal than I really was aiming for. So I feel like I cheated a bit. It was a better cut, beautiful cut. My God, this is sharp. Massive credit to Emberleaf Workshops there, who are fairly close to me, actually. Great guys, go and check out their knives. But that was, a, for me, a beautiful cut. Um, and the fact that the bottle landed on the post kind of tells you there wasn't a lot of resistance laterally. But I know that I cheated a bit by moving it through a bigger angle, which of course takes more, more space and more time. And an opponent, an imaginary opponent, is more likely to be able to react to that and deal with it. So here we're trying to really look at these very flick cuts, forward cuts. Let's try one final sword. Okay, so the final sword that we're going to use here is the massive uh, rapier from LKH, and it's a beautiful blade. Now, I've mentioned this many times in videos already, and I will mention it in the full review which is coming of this, but this isn't a typical rapier because this is more what I'd term a military rapier. This blade is akin to a large side sword blade, or it's even similar to some medieval arming swords. It's fairly broad, okay? So it's broader than most rapiers are. We could still loosely call it a rapier, and certainly the, you know, the style of the hilt would make people call this a rapier. Technically, I kind of think of this as more like a, a kind of giant side sword or even a, um, a kind of swept hilt cavalry sword. And I will say also, compared to the others, it's quite thin in the blade up here, which means it should have less resistance going through the bottle. It's got a point of balance a bit closer back to the hand, so it's got quite a responsive tip because it's supposed to be a rapier. Uh, but it is a big blade, it's quite a long blade, and that can make it a little bit more unwieldy. I'm going to try, I've got two more bottles here, I'm going to try and do uh, the minimum amount of lateral movement and try and do only forward movement as much as I can. Here we go. So do you know what? There were some problems with that cut because I fouled the wood. I actually went through the bottle and buried the blade in the wood underneath, which is an interesting thing by itself because it went into the wood. But nevertheless, that was actually a really damned clean cut. Um, so I was actually quite happy with that. Um, uh, the final bottle I've got is a milk bottle. They're actually easier to cut, but let's see what happens. Here we go. And again, I am not doing the most powerful cuts. I'm not doing the biggest cuts. I'm specifically trying to do this with the minimum uh, tip movement required to get from one side of the target to the other side of the target. Okay, so I didn't get as many cuts. I aimed too low, unfortunately, but nevertheless, it just glided straight through. What I'm going to do now is have a look at some wood. So hopefully you can see now I have got a wet wood branch. So these are branches that have come off the trees in my garden. They've been sitting in a log pile on the top and they've been getting very wet over winter. So they'll be a little bit, a little bit rotten maybe, um, but certainly soaked well through because this is England. Uh, so I'm going to try with the Munich uh, Town Guard side sword. 
One difference I'm going to make is where I strike on the blade. So something we really should have mentioned earlier on is about centre of percussion. Now against a water bottle, if I do a flick cut up here, it stands a good chance of going through. Against a harder target like wood, it will not go through up here at the tip. I need to strike further down here, closer to the centre of percussion. On this sword, the centre of percussion is around here. You find the centre of percussion through means of a pendulum, which I won't go into now. If it's a blunt sword, you can bang it against your hand and the spot that feels the most solid is the centre of percussion. Clearly, I'm not going to do that with a sharp sword. You could do it holding a stick. But anyway, so I'm going to be striking about here and I'm going to be trying to do the most minimum lateral movement I can. Right, let's have a go at that stick. So I don't know if you'll be able to see on camera, but it essentially cut halfway through and the rest of the stick snapped. So let's have another go. So again, in this case, we've cut halfway through that stick, which is about the thickness of an ulna, I should think, and then snapped off the rest. Let's try a much thicker and mossy stick and let's switch sword to the sham shear. Well, actually pretty damned happy with that. There is a focus on the stick. Clean cut about three quarters of the way through and then only the very edge split off the other side. Really actually quite impressed with that. So go Shamshir. Also want to point out something that I've just noticed as I turn the camera off. I can see that the cut, because there's a streak across the blade, went here so it was right up at the tip it wasn't even anywhere near the center of percussion where i expected it was it was right the way up here so the stick actually went through this part of the, part of the blade so almost maximum reach of this amazing blade so i'm going to have a go now with the rapier now against a harder target with the rapier i'm going to have to make sure i strike well down from the tip not up here because it'll do horrible things to the sword potentially it'll be very very weak up there i really need to strike further down nearer the center of percussion and this is the same piece of wood that i just showed before same it's just as i'm cutting the bits down i'm just using the rest of it you know what i was going to say that was awful <laughs> but it wasn't <laughs> Uh, I'm a bit stunned by that. I'm actually even not sure which end I cut now, but both ends have been cut clean. So one of those was the side sword and the other one was the rapier. And that's a fairly thick piece of wood. Yeah, okay, it's soaked, but it's not, it's not rotten. It's just sodden all the way through. A bit like living bone, I have to say, as a former archeologist uh, and someone who has butchered uh, dead pigs, that is quite, uh, an eye opener. I didn't expect that at all. So I'm going to have another go with the rapier and I'm going to have to use a new piece of wood. So full honesty, uh, it did start to cut through it and then it split the rest. So I'm going to have another go. There you go, failed to cut. Uh, so I'm going to keep that in so you know I'm not cheating. I did strike a bit too far up, nearer the point. I'll strike a bit further down now. So you know what, it didn't go through, but that is not an inconsiderable cut. If that was on your head or your wrist or your forearm, that'd be bad, bad news. And this is wood, okay? And this is a fairly hard piece of wood as well. Just for comparison, I'm gonna do this with a full arm rotation so you can see the contrast. So this is one hard piece of wood. In actual fact, what happened is it scooped. So it went in, flexed and bent and twisted around and it snapped it off. However, I have to say the sword is 
perfectly straight and holding up very well. So just for comparison, I'm going to do a full arm cut with the Type 14 Royal Armourer's sword. So a very, very different beast. You'll see it went... This is a hard piece of wood, incidentally. This is probably off an oak tree that's just here. So it's probably oak. Um, and you can see that flat angle there did a very smooth cut all the way through and then it snapped off the second half. Obviously, this type of sword is much more powerful at cutting heavy, hard targets. If you were bashing into shield rims or into pole arm shafts, spear shafts or or the upper part of people's arms, this is going to be a more powerful weapon, cutting weapon, than the rapier is. But, as you've seen, that's not to say that the rapier can't still do formidable cuts to specific targets. So just to finish off, we're going to go back to the rapier and we're going to do a flick cut at a thinner branch. Boom. Look at that for a clean cut. I'm happy with that. Now, maybe you will argue that I moved the sword in with more motion, motion and further out of the horizontal than you would have liked. But the fact is that these type of flicks, okay, we're not just pushing and touching, but they are minimal cuts. We're not doing them with a full arm rotation from the elbow. We're not even doing with the moulinet from the wrist. These are straightforward direct cuts. And that is solid wood. This isn't tatami mat. This isn't a pool noodle. That is solid wood. So, would you want that on your wrist, or your hand, or your collarbone, or your head, or your neck? I don't think so. <laughs> anyway, I hope this video has been useful for some of you, thought-provoking. Your thoughts, your responses, your requests for things you want to see me do in the future down in the comments below. Thanks a lot for watching, and I hope to see you back on the channel really soon. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.